Welcome to the Home Building Hub, your essential podcast guide to building your new home. Hosted by industry experts Colin Bischoff and Darren Brennan, this conversational podcast will help better educate you about all things new home building so you can avoid costly mistakes and enjoy your building experience to the fullest, no matter which home builder you choose. Hey guys, and welcome to the Home Building Hub uh, podcast. This is my first introduction, so Colin's got a big smile on his face because he's thinking, how's Darren going to wing this? And we decided this about 30 seconds ago that I'm going to have a crack at it. But, uh, you know, great to uh, have you guys listening in and watching in on uh, all the different uh, areas that you are. And, you know, we've had some some really great episodes so far this year. And Cole, mate, how are you going, mate? Uh Great to be recording. Great to have a bit of a chance at having a crack at the intro, mate. Well done, Daz. Um, well, look, I, I feel I feel that you've done a good job at the intro, and I also feel like um, I've been sent back to the reserves a little bit, <laughs> just quietly. So I've been demoted, um, but no, all good. Good to mix it up a little bit. Feeling good. We've got a very good uh, episode today. So this is something that uh, we commonly get asked about. And what's that going to be? Mate, we're going to talk to everyone about why do builders' site costs vary so much? And it's something that you see all the time. And I think it's a really cool little, be a short, sharp episode, but I think hopefully you guys will get plenty of value out of that. Cole, tell us about the fee for the podcast. You know, we, we love to talk about that every week. Yes. So it's obviously free to listen, but we prefer to, to advise you there's a fee which is just leave us a, a five-star review. If you could, that would be number one. And please share the podcast. So some people are watching on YouTube, a lot of people are listening uh, through whatever platform you're using, Spotify, Apple, etc. Please just share it with someone so they can get some value if they're looking to build a new home because there's so much more, so much content here that, that can really help them along the way. So that's it, Daz. No, great. Mate, I'd love to go ramble on about myself and yourself, but rather than do that, if you want to find out a bit about us, Go back to episode one. We've given a bit of an intro about who we are, what we're all about and what the podcast is about. But, um, mate, we're going to jump straight in. And so basically why, the question is, why uh, do site costs vary between builders? And I'm going to kick off on that one, mate, which is I think it starts off with the standard inclusions that builders offer. So, um, you know, you may have one builder offering a, um, a H-class slab as a standard and another builder offering an M-class slab, which is probably the most common slab that most builders base their pricing off, but that's going to vary the cost significantly. And, and what does that look like? You know, difference between H and M could be depending on the size of the footprint of the house, somewhere between, let's just call rough figures, five to 10 grand, could be more. Um, just in that item alone. So all of a sudden, your site costs are out by five to 10 grand. And that's a big difference, right? Um, some of the other ones, some builders will give you an overall figure. They say site costs and it might pick up some of the council requirements. Um, related back to building specifically to that site, they say all that figure, it's 20 grand or 30 grand, whatever their number is. Others will break it down. They'll say, well, here's a council cost, here's a foundation cost, here's a um, a connections cost, and they break it down. And there you're a bit confused, well, which one's site cost, which ones are not. They're telling me that's not site cost, but the other guy's telling me it is. So they will vary that amount again. Um, a few more like that. Um, some builders fix their site costs, so they'll say, great, it's fixed. Others um, won't fix them at all. They'll put in an allowance, and then once they get the key information, being a soil test and level survey, um, and they may want some of the connection details from the property services information, so find out where pipes are and how deep they are, sewer, water, etc. all those connection points, and then they'll fix that price. They may also want an engineered slab design. And what you've got to realize is engineers are very much involved in this part of the process and we'll talk to that as we go. But um, that's going to make a big difference to those costs. Um, some of those fixed site costs are fixed, but they've got exclusions. So fixed, but some things aren't fixed. I don't know that's quite fixed, but anyway, that's sometimes the case. Others are fixed with no exclusions whatsoever so again if it's fixed with no exclusions it's probably going to be slightly higher if it's fixed with some exclusions it's probably going to be lower so um, understanding what that's like again some builders include the cost to excavate and get rid of any rock that's on the site others don't 
And again, rock can be significant. You know, sometimes they pull out heaps and heaps of rock. And, and we're talking not a little bit. It could be thousands and thousands of dollars worth of excavation of rock. That's sometimes included and other times it's not. So it's just that's why you're going to get these varying. The whole thing can be pretty bloody confusing, Cole, to be fair. Tell us a bit about some of the other things that you think uh, that sit in that lineup, man. Yeah, I think as a client, you don't need to be a site cost expert. So leave that to the builder. I understand one thing is that the builder that you're talking to has the absolute right to include something or exclude something uh, within their base price at whatever level they choose. It's just for them to explain to you and for you to understand, okay, if I go to builder B, the M class slab is the entry level slab. That's what I get in the base price. So the site cost will perhaps be higher. If I go to builder B, they already include a higher level slab. So therefore my site cost with that builder are likely to be a little bit lower. But at the end of the day, it all comes out in the wash. You don't worry specifically about the site cost figure and make a decision of an on a builder because of that. It's just not the right approach. What you need to do is understand that you're looking at the overall quote, the house design, the inclusions, the, you know, the reputability of that builder. And really most importantly, and above all is who do you like the most? Who do you trust the most? Which consultant has given you the education, the information, and which one do you feel most comfortable with? Don't choose one over five or 10 grand. It's not worth it. And I have this argument with clients every week, Darren, probably shouldn't say argument, discussion. Um, just, and I see people make a decision to go go with the builder because they're 10K cheaper. Six months later, they pick up the phone. They say, oh, it didn't go so well. I'm like, well, I told you, but I can't go and you know, say bad things about other builders because it's not, not in our nature to do that either. So please be mindful of that. I think it is breaking down that whatever it is they're offering so you understand what you're getting. So, you know, if one's including something that the other builder's not, and one just really quick example, I know it's the next one on the list there, Cole, is retaining walls. If one builder's including retaining walls, it's going to cost a lot more. And if the other builder's not, then it's going to be cheaper. However, the end outcome, if you've got a block with fall on it, the retaining walls are going to save you money on landscaping, give you a much more usable backyard, right? These things are going to be really important. So understand what you're getting. I remember actually going, I was thinking it was in our Simmons days many years ago, but it wasn't actually. I was working at Burbank at the time and we missed out on a, on a deal. And I went to this guy's house and he's like, come and look at my place. And it didn't have retaining walls when we had quoted him. He's like, your cycles were so much more expensive. It would have been a five meter drop on a 45 degree angle from his front door to the street. If he tripped over, he'd do six somersaults before he slam dunked into the concrete. I'm like, it's so not usable at all. It's crazy. The other one could be even driveway gradient. So how do you get into your driveway? And you know. I've seen some recently down in Warrnambool where these blocks have got heaps of fault. There's driveways that you can't get the car in the garage. You're going to have to go up. The car's going to become airborne and somehow you're going to get the car to stop before you smash through the back of your garage. Otherwise, you never get your car in there. If you had a full drive, it'll be too tall for the, for the garage opening. Just not usable at all. That's crazy stuff. And that's the bit that you want to talk to your builder about and understand because I think the customer gets his keys to his house and goes, well, I've now got myself a, another room on my house that I'm meant to park my car in that's got a garage door on that I almost should put a window on because I'm never going to be able to put a car in there. So, you know. Yeah, I think um, just to help, I guess for, for what we do, Darren, we do full turnkey. So that means landscaping, you know, front and back and fencing and whatnot. And one of the most common things we include in all quotes is an, an allowance for retaining walls. So we have a bit of a guide and each of our builders that we use, they're a little bit different. Some, um, so to explain what a retaining wall is, it's basically the, those timber sleepers that hold up the dirt. So the, the next block doesn't, you know, fall on top of yours basically. Um, so retaining walls can cost a fair bit of money and that's why it's important for us to look at site costs uh, for you to, to determine these things. And a builder who perhaps doesn't, have landscaping as part of the what they include, which is most, they, they're happy to um, just, just leave it with no retaining walls a lot of the time and, and do what's called batter or slope the block off and just leave it and call it a day. But when you come around to do your landscaping and do your fencing, you will have to put in retaining walls or you're going to have half a cliff in your backyard or your front yard or whatever it may be. So it's not a cost that you, you're not going to pay. It's just 
if it's something you've got to be mindful. And in our case, again, Darren, we do have clients go and choose someone else because, oh, well, they don't have retaining walls. They say, I don't need them. It's like, but they're not doing landscaping for you. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we try yeah. our best, um, <laughs> regardless of what you offer, we try our best to give you reality and, and try and save you the money and put the fees in or costs in up front. But things like retaining walls um, is definitely a big one. But you, you have to... It's really your call, and and unfortunately, people down and I see them make the wrong decision, and I can't really try and convince them too hard the other way. But some of those other things, I think that going back to your list and your question, um, that people can put in site costs. Some people will have fixed site costs, and then separately they'll have council requirements, and then separately they'll have additional solar panels. If it's north facing, you'll need two solar panels. We only include one, so it's going to be X dollars for another one. Some will just include it. Like there's so many variables to this, um, you know, solar hot water service and things like that. Um, another one would be the outdoor room or, or no, known as an alfresco, if, whether that's got concrete uh, included or not. These sorts of things, some will, some won't. They're all things that need to be explained and I guess the list goes on. So, yes, we've probably done a good job, Darren, at, at confusing people so far in the episode. The point remains let the builder, let the consultant, the one or the two or the three of them you're dealing with, explain this for you. And don't just look at the, the side cost figure, look at the overall figure, the inclusions, and, and always go with the person you trust the most. I think, um, Cole, the other one that blows my mind is that you get, so, so for the listeners, your house slab design will be designed by an engineer, independent of your builder, right? And so that engineer will say, these are the things you need to do right? They are reading off a certain set of information from the soil test, the survey. Um, they might require some of the property services information. So items about the, um, you know, where your connection points are, etc. So all that's coming into play. And then you'll get different answers from two experts who have both gone to the same school, essentially, to learn how to become an engineer. And then you get two separate answers. And then one will be more expensive than the other. So I guess, it's worth understanding that that's the case. Um, you know, I guess, what does that mean? I mean, all the slab design on new homes, as I say, they're all designed by an engineer, but they also now have to do all of the um, storm water piping around the home to make sure that all the water gets away. So the engineer is going to design that as well. And they each one will have a slightly different requirement, as in the engineer might say, you know, hey, we think you need this. The next engineer says, we think you need something different, and they come at a different cost. So that's going to also vary that cost for you. Um, you also will have some ultra conservative engineers, right? So they're going to be going, well, hold on. In the worst case scenario, and we're talking about an apocalypse sort of type scenario, this could happen. And if that happens, then we're going to have to put extra steel in your slab, more concrete. We're going to add more cost and more cost and more cost. And, you know, your builder's going to have to pass that cost on and they won't get that slab design signed off unless they meet that requirement that the engineer specified. You know, and I guess what I would say in that case is don't worry if your engineer over-engineers your slab, you're going to end up with less problems down the track and then it costs you more up front, but likely less problems down the track. If they put extra steel, extra concrete, your slab is going to be, you know, it's not going to be a skinny slab anymore. It's going to be a thick slab, right? <clears throat> and that's probably going to cause less headaches down the track, but it's going to come at a higher cost. So, you know, I've seen some ultra conservative engineers over the years and, and, and you know, it blows my mind how much more they add in. I understand why. And again, they're protecting themselves. They're also protecting the builder, but they're also protecting you, the homeowner, in the end. Because the last thing you want to do is see your, slab, your house slab move. So, so you know, each engineer can have a different opinion, and that can vary the cost. Yeah, good point. the The process for fixed site costs up front before the engineer even gets to it is that we we look at the documentation the developer provides us and they've got little numbers on the corners of the blocks and that tells us how much fill and fall there is that's all the builders got to go off and they're taking a huge risk at fixing site costs based on those numbers because by the time that site's actually delivered and you walk out there and it actually gets a soil survey test all that sort of a feature survey done those levels do change so site costs have been fixed for you because that's just what everyone does but the reality is 
no builder should be fixing side cuts up front. They should all wait for engineering um, and, and to, to make an actual a proper decision, but they, they also want people to build houses through them. So it's just become pretty common, pretty normal for everyone to fix where they can up front, which introduces a range of different requirements based on the builder's perception and like Darren said the engineer's perception so if in our case as we have a panel of builders and they they have different engineers so we when we do site costs for builder a or b or c we actually have completely different levels of site costs based on how they engineer or based on the number of retaining walls they would allow for one builder wants retaining walls triggered at when there's only 400 mil fall across a block which is you know very light on and very conservative other builders are like no nah, it's fine we'll just sort it out you know so this is why it's such a complex thing you know so an engineer will be the final decision maker that has been you know um, brought on by the builder the builder can go back and argue with the engineer if they like i think that the price for these site costs is astronomical because you over engineering the term is used but then the engineer is going to sit there and say, that's fine. You can take out these three things. It's like um, playing Jenga. It's like if you've got a full stack to begin with. <laughs> yeah, that's my fall down. <laughs> yeah, but the, the the cost of that full stack is is a lot. And, and, the build, and you know, one, one engineer may take two of those, those Jenga pieces out and say, look, that's still really sturdy and that's fine. It'll cost your client a little bit less. And, and if the builder argues and says, take two more out, they'll say, look, it'll still stand. That's no, no worries. Be cheaper for your client, but you're going to put in writing to me that you made this request. I'm not going to sign it. You know, like it's it's safer for you, the client, that that the uh, foundation of your home, if it costs a little bit more, it's actually better for you because and the future of your the foundation of the home going into many years ahead. So I think we um, you can hear a bit of passion in this one, Darren. We uh, didn't plan too much. We knew this would come pretty naturally this episode, but. I'm hoping we haven't overly confused the situation, but uh, hopefully educated some people along the way. Um, yeah, so I think uh, one other thing that we probably didn't mention was around the differences that the builder then determines. So if they've got an engineer that advises one thing or another, it's then the builder's call to say whether they want to yeah, put on something like, let's say, uh, normal waffle pod slab or whether they want to upgrade to a raft slab, which is a different type of slab, um, generally costs a little bit more um, and that's for the protection of the client's home and the foundation um, you can understand that a builder warrants these houses so it's ultimately their call and their risk to take whoever's got that that name on your contract with the building license they're the ones that are going to have to make sure that you know seven ten years minimum and, and a lot of people offer more they're going to have to warrant that that slab to make sure that everything's all safe and sound so they want to make sure that it's done properly with an engineer that they can trust. And that all comes back around to the front end when you're getting a quote off a sales consultant, all those decisions have been pre-made about if this, then that, here's the price, um, here's what we do include, here's what we don't include, here's what would be extra if it pops up, et cetera. That's why it varies so much, Darren. Absolutely. I think, um, Cole, one that I, I see out there a lot is, um, you know, the standard warranty offered on a home seven years, but some builders are now offering up to a lifetime. And again, as you can imagine, if you're offering a lifetime guarantee and someone ends up living in that home for 50 or 60 years, that's a long time to be guaranteeing that nothing's going to happen. So again, those builders will work with their engineers and generally beef up their slabs a bit more because they, they're going to have to, because they're offering this long time warranty. Now, they're generally those warranties are with the first homeowner only. So if you flog the house, the, the lifetime warranty goes. But if you stick in that house for a long period of time, then the builder is going to warrant that for for a significantly further period of time, and and they're going to protect themselves. So again, those warranty bits are going to come into play. You know, I guess in the end, there's so many variables um, on site costs that. It's not that there's a right or a wrong. It's just that they're different. And then it's about going back, talking to your new home consultant, understanding, asking lots of questions, finding out a bit about what are they going to include in theirs that possibly another builder may or may not, right? And then understanding, well, are those things important to me? Retaining walls might not be important to you, but the other you know so in which case you're happy to pay less you might you might be a landscaper and can put them in yourself great do that go with the cheaper side costs 
because you're going to have a solution to that yourself, right? But you might not be that person and the retaining walls or the retaining walls might be required to get a permit from that builder, you know, and again, the house could be wider, for example. So you're thinking I've got a 25 square house, but one's skinnier on the block. So it doesn't need retaining walls because you're not as close to the boundaries. The other design that you're looking at is wider and it needs those. So these sort of variables all come into play um, that, you know, will vary that site cost amount. So just don't assume because Colin told you it's going to be 15 grand from his builder and I tell you it's going to be 20, um, that, that you're getting the same thing. They're going to be different because it's going to be based on the builder's requirements, the builder's design, your block, and the requirements of the engineer, the concreters, and all these people involved in that process. So, you know, you can't just go, well, I just want to have theirs. <laughs> you know, they're not the same house. They're not the same people. So, And uh, also we hear a lot land agents giving a guide to what site cost should be on that block. Um, and we talk to a lot of land agents and developers and they, they are our friends, but I will tell my friends um, when I don't agree with them. And in this case, land agents should not be telling clients an idea of what the site cost should be to be expected because it's builder dependent. It depends on a whole bunch of things. So um, it's not, yeah, it, as a client, it's so confusing for you and we understand that. So we are here to try and simplify the process for you, give you the education. And some of the things we've said in this episode definitely are go on the uh, more technical side. But at the end of the day, I hope that we've explained that it site costs can vary builder to builder and you have to accept that's the way it is based on what they include as standard, based on what they decide with their what they're willing to accept and put out there uh, as a finished product based on the agreement that they have with their engineer, whether they are very conservative or not conservative at all or everything in between. Those three factors can significantly change what site cost can be. So taking assumptions from people, uh, anyone that is not a builder consultant about what site cost should be and, and the perception you think that they're too expensive because builder A is 20 grand and builder B is 10, hopefully this episode helps declutter all of that difference. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you do, like always, have any questions around this, feel free to jump on the Home Building Hub uh, website um, and, uh, you know, hit the uh, in inquire, I'm going to say, but hit the, uh, you know, ask us button and we'll uh, be able to help you guys out with any of those questions. Um, Cole, we're going to wrap it up, mate. Now, you've got a busy day, as do I. Uh, great to uh, knock another episode out, mate. Something we're both really passionate about. Really enjoyed this one. I'm handballing it back to you for the intro for the next one, mate. I think uh, I think you do a better job than I do. I haven't taken your, 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 your uh, you know, I pegged you on this one, mate, but I haven't got you on the rest of them, mate. But uh, really look forward to uh, the next episode. We've got a really good one coming up. And, um, yeah, mate, moving forward, mate, have a great weekend. Good on you guys. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next one. Indeed. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Home Building Hub. As part of the podcast, we'd have to be a little careful to cover ourselves on a legal standpoint. So we do have a disclaimer. Whilst we're all about providing value to you, this podcast should not be considered legal or financial advice. It does contain general information only, and you should seek out independent professional advice on your own personal situation before you make any legal or financial decisions. One.